And tonight we have a very special program that will feature Joseph Rodriguez, Jamal Shabazz, and moderated by Lisa Dubois. We will have a Q&A at the end of the program, and you could either post questions to the chat, um, but please wait till later towards the Q&A when you do that. Otherwise, your questions will just get lost in the other chat, or you can use the raise your hand function. And um, please feel free to chat during the presentation. And just let us now where you let us know now where you're chatting from. It's always great to see um, everybody just check in and say hi and where you're, where you're from. I'd now like to turn this over to the moderator for tonight's program, Lisa Dubois, but first let me introduce her. Lisa is a New York-based ethnographic photojournalist and curator. She's exhibited her work both internationally and domestically, including at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture and at the Gordon Parks Museum in Fort Kansas. As a freelance photographer, she's contributed to several major news publications and stock photo agencies, including Getty, Post, and the Daily News. Lisa has been recognized by The Guardian and The New York Times for her work as a photographer and curator for X Gallery. Lisa is a member of Enfoco and a contributor to Social Documentary Network and is a contributing photographer and writer for Roots Magazine and a contributor to The Edge of Humanity Magazine. And Lisa is also the newest board member of SDN. So Lisa. Thank you, Glenn. Good evening, everyone. I am really happy to be here and involved with Social Documentary Network, an online platform who I believe and feel is documenting very important historic events that are taking place around the world. Documentary Matters is an important vehicle for photographers to support each other and learn from each other. So I wanna thank all of you who have joined Documentary Matters today with special guests, Joseph Rodriguez and Jamal Shabazz. Both of these photographers have extraordinary experiences and I am sure that everyone will leave tonight having gained some insight into the world of photography through the eyes of these two very talented photographers, Joseph and Jamal. We'll be spending approximately 20 minutes with each photographer as they tell their story, and we will view some of their images, and then we'll have some further discussion with them together and let them speak amongst themselves as well. And at the very end, Glenn will take questions from all of you, anyone who wants to ask specific questions. So I'm going to start with Joseph. Um, Joseph was born and raised in Brooklyn. His photographs are raw intense and depict life unfiltered just as he experiences it. He studied photography in the School of Visual Arts and in the photojournalism and documentary photography program at the International Center of Photography in New York City. Rodriguez teaches at New York University and has taught in the International Center of Photography, also at universities in Mexico and Europe and Scandinavia. His dedication to photography has led him to exhibit his work around the world, including the African American Museum, as well as the Frida and Roy Berman Gallery. So I wanna begin by asking Joseph, um, if you can start by telling us what actually inspired you to go into the world <clears throat> of photography. Um, I think it was, well, let's see. During my younger years, um, I was pretty much on the streets and I, I was lost as a Jew. Um, went to Rikers Island two times. On the second time out, I realized that I had to try to do something a little bit different. So um, I, I got a job. I was working in a shoe polish factory. That gave me some stability. And I took care of my addiction by, you know, doing what was necessary and trying to change my situation. And then while I was coming home one day from, from the factory work, I used to walk, I lived in Fort Greene and I used to walk from Bed-Stuy and along on Bedford Avenue was the Ch Brooklyn Children's Museum. And then there was an advertisement in the window for a black and white photography class being taught by Buford Smith, um, an African-American photojournalist who was, you know, basically saved my, I really have to say it kind of saved my life because, um, you know, I got really kind of hooked onto this camera and 
started um, developing my own film and and uh, shooting people in my community. And uh, but then I got mugged and then I lost my cameras and then I didn't touch a camera uh, probably for another 15 years. And uh, it was during the 80s when I be I was driving a taxi cab just to pay for my rent. And I decided to go to the International Center of Photography and take uh, uh, the uh, documentary photojournalism program with Fred Richard. And that they gave me a scholarship and that kind of just changed my direction completely. Um, I was still working as a taxi driver, didn't have much time to photograph. That was very frustrating because we were in school seven days a week, um, even on the weekends. And so, oh, well, seven days a week, the weekends we had these weekend workshops. And I was very frustrated because all these other students, they came from Europe and other places in the world and they had money and support. But so I had to figure something out. So the only time I had to photograph was me in the cab. So I began by starting shooting, you know, through the windows. And then one day, I, you know, um, I had the opportunity of taking a class with uh, Mary Ellen Mark and she kind of kicked me in the butt by saying, hey, how come you're not photographing the people in the back seat? And so, you know, I didn't have that strength and courage to do that then. But, you know, she gave me an aside. She, it, I never forget this. She 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 said to me, listen, when you get up and you obviously don't believe yourself as a photographer. And well, she was so sharp. Right. I mean. And she said, when you get up in the morning, I'd like you to stand in front of the mirror and tell yourself you're a photographer. Now that might sound very <laughs> okay to a lot of people, but that was kind of like a therapy that I would go through, kind of like a method actor in a way, and I'm getting ready for this part, you know, that I need to play. And actually it helped, it helped a lot. So um, I, I grew and uh, I thank her for that. And there were other teachers along the way that, I mean, it was Gilles Perez and Eugene Richards and Cesar Maizelis and Sebastian Salgado and Kudelka and Ramon de Pardon. And it was just like this bouquet of this incredible documentary photographers that were coming into our classrooms. Um, so, yeah, after that, I, it was on. I, I just, I was, that's it. <laughs> Photography was my life. So. What, would, what was your first big series that you started to work on? The first one we started to take it really seriously. Yeah, I would say Taxi was was an attempt to try to be very serious with mm -hmm. trying to make, you know, pictures. I, I mean, I love my city. I mean, I grew up, you know, you know, just a tough town, you know. So, um, and I, I was the kind of cab driver I went everywhere. So. Why don't I, we start looking at some of these taxi images, okay? Please do. I'm going to share my screen and let's see, do this at full screen. Yeah. Oh, no, that didn't work. One second. Actually, this didn't take us. Let me go back to the beginning. OK. Want to refresh that? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just give you a little debrief. So I was the kind of cab driver that would drive everywhere, all five boroughs, because when I was a kid with my mom and we were trying to get a cab from Williamsburg, well, nobody would stop for us. There was only one car service out here. It was called Black Pearl. And they were run by African-American drivers. And, you know, so I, I was open to everybody, you know. And so I wanted to sort of, you know, explore my city. So from the Bronx to Staten Island, Staten Island, Brooklyn, Manhattan, you know, even out to Jersey, you know, there I was taking pictures. So um, I, I felt uh, it could be an interesting look. Uh, also, as a, you know, there's so many street photographers in the world today. I think to photograph the street through a car window is probably one of the coolest things that photographers can do, right? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, I remember that I met a, a, a photographer out in L.A. who in Los Angeles, you know, here we take the subway and the buses, but there they drive on the freeways. And it was this photographer that was shooting people stuck in traffic. And it, the work was incredible. I don't know, I think he made a book or something. And, and that kind of always kind of stuck in the back of my head as, as to what I was trying to deal with as I was driving. But And also I learned the, uh, uh, I learned a lot about, us people, human beings, because that yellow box that I'm driving in was 
It was like a little bit of a psychiatrist office. Everybody had a story. Everybody wanted to tell you something, you know. I bet. Yeah. Did you ever think that you would be discussing these photographs that many years later and with people all around the world? No, I, I, I didn't, actually. I didn't think people would really really care but you know as Jamel was saying earlier you know we have this time now where we can go back into our work and and I I think I think it was a good time for the work to come out because we were all stuck COVID wise and everybody was trying to dreaming of New York and let me give you what the 80s were like it wasn't a party it was a tough time I mean we had you know sex workers on the street we had homeless as we have today and you know the economy was bad, you know, you know, there's a lot of things going on. Yeah. So um, I just, you know, felt it, lived it. You know, I got my, I got my, my, my black radio station on in my cab and I'm driving and I'm, and I'm just, like, you know, just checking out the city. And so um, sometimes you don't know what you're making when you're making pictures you really don't you don't know it's like Cote Bresson said would always say you rediscover your work when you go back to your contact sheets mm -hmm. and that's what happened that's exactly what happened you know a couple of years back I started looking at taxi and I said well is there something here and I started remembering the stories the backstories like you know there's a there's a picture of this African-American family in, in, in the taxi cab and you know, right before I picked up that family, you know, I, I had two gay men in the back seat trying to have sex in my cab. I mean, it was just like the most bizarre kind of like thing that could happen on an early Sunday morning. And then, you know, here comes a breath of sunshine. This African-American family is going to church, right? So I was like, oh, wow, this is so beautiful compared to what I was just looking at. So, um, but that's the city. You know, we're, we're the naked city. We got a million and one stories here and everyone does have a story. That's for sure. And the next um, series that you, that you were, that you focused on after that, because I don't know what's happening. When I, gra when I graduated IC, when I graduated ICP in 1985, I, 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 I began working at Black Stars, the photo agency as a researcher. And so I, I, I was studying photography even more there and looking and seeing what photographers were, were, were kind of stories they were making. And I began uh, my own personal series in Spanish Hall. And I used to go up there on the weekends. I, you know, I had a budget of two rolls of film and I was shooting Kodachrome slides. So that was very challenging. Uh, but that that project turned into a National Geographic sto story. Growing up in East Hall in May 1990, cover story, proudest day of my life. So excuse me, Joseph. Uh, somebody just told me that they're not seeing my full screen. They're just seeing these slides. No, we're, I'm only seeing small pictures slides. Well, that's... yeah, I, we we just we're looking at. Uh, I see a screen that looks like uh, like uh, a bridge screen, right? Is that what yeah. you use in bridge, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm showing. Um, okay, I well, went to full. Go. I went now, to full now, screen. Yeah. I can see it now. It's good now. Yeah. You can you can see it all now. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry about that. All right. So Spanish Hall was 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 you know it, it was close to home. I, the reason why I started photographing Spanish Hall was um, we already did a project in school called the gentrification of East Harlem. Was nine students. We had a multimedia project that we that Fred Richen had us had us do. But uh, I was personally affected by the media that I would see every weekend, every every week, every weekend, I would read the papers and it was oh, baby thrown off the roof or fires or nothing but tragedy. And I, I knew I knew that there was tragedy and poverty and crime, but there was also a family and there was also religion. There was also culture. And so that's where I began to start to think about, you know, there, you know, there are a lot of great photographers out there and, you know, and they're, they're telling their stories the way they should see it. But I wanted to speak about how, uh, and I wasn't even thinking about an activist. I just wanted to show people what else was there. Yeah. That's um, this image, can you tell us where, what was happening at this time? This is, this is Monique. Uh, she, um, was pouting actually. She was a little upset. Mom wanted, mom said, No, you're staying upstairs, you're doing your homework. She wanted to go outside. And downstairs in that building was 24 hours drugs being sold. 
So it's very dangerous kind of block that they lived on. She was very upset with having to stay, you know, and do her homework. And so she was just pouting in her room. This is not a setup. I didn't push the doll there or the teddy bear there. This was her. And the only thing I asked is if she don't look at me, I asked her to look out the window. And so, right. yeah. The color's amazing. Mm -hmm. And the blue. Uh, yeah, you know, keep me cuelo. You know, I mean, it's just, it's about what the neighborhood is. I mean, it's, you know, people, people love it there. You know, it's, 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 uh, yeah, just a lot of warmth there. I mean, there's tragedy, but there's warmth and family and family, like the Rodriguez family. I know them still to this day. I'm still close with this family. And that's this like 35 years later. This is a beautiful image of this family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the cover of the, the, the latest book, El Barrio in the 80s. This one, the one with the, all the children? Uh, yeah, the one with the children, the Friday Night Cards. Yep, absolutely. That's that's the cover of, of the, the newest. Beautiful, beautiful image. Now, you wouldn't know that this family was going through some horrific time. There was drugs being sold. Peter's strung out on crack and heroin. Mm -hmm. We got him on methadone. That's great. And the family was split up and the kids were born and we're still connected to them. But, uh, you know, there's something more that I needed to show uh, of an addict, right? I mean, it's so easy to photograph somebody with a needle in their arm or a pipe in their hand and photograph them in their, in their worst hour. And I've seen that work so many times, but you're not going to tell me that an addict does not have love in their heart that an addict can't love their children. Yes, I mean, uh, we know the stories and all that, that there's some people who shouldn't be parents, I get that, but, but this was something that was extremely important to me, being an ex-addict that I knew. Every time I would see these other photographers photograph these communities, they always came back with the same kind of image. Glenn, move on. Let's, let's look at some of the other images. Sure. This is great. Listen, that was a birthday party. So everybody was just in good spirits that day. Yeah. This is the image that I was mentioning. Of the <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the Spanish. Yeah, it was a birthday series. party for Peter's, um, uh, one of Peter's family members. And you know, everybody came and inside that white, inside that little bar, that place right behind him was where the birthday party was. And um uh, so it was a little tight. So the family came out outside and, you know, we had some food outside and people are in good spirits and music is pumping. That's the only thing we can't hear right now. Um, but um, yeah, and Pleasant Avenue, what is Pleasant Avenue? That was the Italian American section. You know, I can tell you, you know, if everybody remembers The Godfather and you remember that one scene when they were trying to bring heroin into the, into the neighborhood, they're talking about East Harlem. And that's a fact, that, that narrative inside The Godfather. Anyways, Sunday mornings, I used to go up on Sunday mornings. Why did I go up on Sunday morning? That was the only time I really had, uh, and, and I had a strategy. My strategy was, see, most of the criminals were sleeping Sunday morning. So like, I could walk around and be a street photographer and not have to worry about my cameras. And the light is so great at that time. Early, yeah, early early early. right before sunrise because exactly, that's really, yeah. really good or it's stay out later in the afternoon it was important for me to like this picture i waited two years for this picture very important picture for me in my life with my family <laughs> let's look at the picture on the stoop first of all that's how we lived our lives right and it's similar to helen levitt's pictures of people on the stoops back in the day she sat in the same community however we're all the fathers we're all the men. Mm. Right. So, you know, honoring my mother is what this picture is. Honoring my aunts is what mm. this picture is about. Yeah. Oh, are we going, are we going to talk about this now? Or yeah, we, we got five minutes. Well, let's LAPD, talk about LAPD, this. A book yeah. we just published uh, most recently this year uh, with uh, the artist edition in Copenhagen. Uh, I met this gentleman, Steve Sunland, who, who came to New York and he said, hey, he wanted to work with me a little bit. He said, 
uh, I was thinking about trying to, he was just starting out his publishing company and he wanted to do a book. And I said, well, I've got a lot of material here. What do you want to look at? And so he was connecting to this LAPD work, which is a New York Times Magazine cover, sto uh, cover story in January, 1995. And I got the opportunity to drive around with Rampart. This is right before training day, uh, the movie. And so this is the precinct I'm working with, right? Yeah. And so just looking at the uh, police and what they do, uh, I didn't have an agenda. I, I, although I know what it was like to be arrested and be in the back of a police car, but when you work for the Times, you have to be, you know, you have to be a journalist without an agenda. So I just went there to see what their job was like day and night. I drove around with them for six weeks. The gentleman who just got shot inside of a park and trying to save his life. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, uh, a, a Korean family, the, one of the family members uh, died of, uh, he died of uh, a choking. He was eating something. And so the police came to ask what, what had happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the next photo uh, was a little bit more controversial. This, this young man was, was robbed and uh, the police came. Uh, to try to find out what happened. Uh, his ID was stolen and everything. And then he was very frustrated. So he breaks down and you see him there. And he, he said to the police, ah, oh, you have all the power. And then the next, another, another cop, you know, the cops in the same grouping, the same scene, uh, started saying things to him like, oh, you must have AIDS, you, you gay, you all the things that we're fighting to try to, you know, change today, right? And, uh, and uh, so that officer was reprimanded and uh, and uh, suspended because of this picture. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, this 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 man was the reason why he was arrested was he had a machete and he was trying to hurt his mother. Uh, when we got to the apartment, it was uh, yeah, it was pretty serious stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was a domestic violence situation that's connected to the photo right below it. Uh, um, what had happened was maybe sh sh that's a tough one to look at, but um, this woman was beaten up by her husband. He, she had the twenty dollars for saving for food. He wanted to drink with it, and so all the neighbors came out. Now we're looking; they're looking for him. So that's what that's what's going on. Is a search for this man. Let me ask a quick question for any photographer thinking about going into this line of work. What kind of mindset do you need to have to do this kind of work? Oh, one that can detach. Because doing this kind of work is it's almost like being a, an ER nurse, right? You're going to see a lot of pain and suffering. How are you going to deal with that? So hopefully you have some love in your life and you have somebody to talk with. But I, I would say that you almost have to have a mindset of, of being a war photographer. Because at this time, this was the the height of gang violence in Los Angeles. It's like 94, 95. Yeah. Here they're going into a hotel that uh, there seems to, they're looking for us, someone wanted for murder. So it was a squat and they were going inside. I mean, I, I have to give it to, it's not easy being a policeman. I mean, I'm, you know, I've been stop and frisked here twice, right? By these great stop and frisk police, uh, simply because I'm Latino. So I know what it's like to be stopped, but to do this job every day is, is very hard. It's a domestic violence situation. So hmm. it seemed to be the main call that was happening. And the next one would be more community policing, basically. So you have a black and brown officer who is very familiar with those guys behind them. There's a whole gang, a couple of gangs in this neighborhood, right? In those projects. So they make their presence known and they're on foot, as you can see, they're not in a car, right? So they know these guys by first name. And it's very different than the policing that you see today where they just come in and, you know, yeah, a very different approach. It's the old school cop on the beat approach. So that's a little bit of uh, what we what we've done. Both both of these are books: Taxi, Journey Through My Windows, and LAPD in 1994. We put out during COVID this year, so we're quite pleased that we were able to put those books out. Um, and and we're going to share your information. So your website, right? You have a lot of information there for people, sure. which is 
we can get to, you know our instagram is is popular rolly six by six or you know josephrodriguez.com you know people i'm i'm an open book i'm like jamel they can find us real easy if okay. you put our names out there yeah okay so we're going to talk um about jamal and talk with jamal on his work and then we will come together and you two can talk you know amongst each other and maybe we join in as well so Jamal, Jamal was also born and raised in Brooklyn, and he is a member of the legendary group Come On Gay. Jamal's bold vision and fearless approach and his belief in himself led him to publish his first book for Powerhouse Books. Jamal's photographic career was officially established in 2002 with the debut of that first book, Back in the Day, which includes Jamel's unique street photographs. This was a time during the emerging hip hop era um, in New York City between 1980 and 1989. Another book in 2003, The Last Sunday in June, is from a collection of 10 years of photographing the Gay Pride Parade in New York City. Sites in the City in 2017 contains work from four decades of photographing people in the city. In 2020, Metro contains photographs made between 1980 and 2018 of people on the subway. Jamel's photographs are recognizable by his unique style that he is very well known for. In many of his images, he chose to focus on love and unity between people. It may be interesting later to hear him discuss how he was led to do that type of uh, style. It could have something to do with his work as a correction officer. So we'll hear about that. Um, Jamel's work has been exhibited worldwide and he has been a guest speaker on various platforms like Photo Plus Expo, drawing very large crowds just to hear his story. And he continues to create new books and interesting projects nonstop. So Jamal, I have a few questions for you. Um, and then we're gonna look at some of Jamal's photographs. Um, so Jamal, can you just begin by telling us a little bit about growing up in the 60s and what impact it has had on your photography career in general? Well, thank you very much for the introduction and, and thank you um, Social Documentary Network and um, Silver Digital for producing this, pro this very important program here. But I am a child of the 1960s and it's that time period that really shaped and molded me as both a person and, an, and a photographer. You know, I grew up in, in, you know, I was born in 1960, so I was coming of age during the Civil Rights Movement and the war in Vietnam. And those two events really impacted me greatly because, you know, watching it on TV and looking at different publications that were coming out on a regular was informing me what was happening happening in my environment. Mind you, I wasn't being taught any of this in school, you know, so I became quite disenchanted early on. Uh, and what's important to note is that my father was a professional photographer and he had converted our two uh, bedroom apartment into a studio on weekends, oftentimes photographing our neighbors and family members. So I grew up seeing the power of images being made in real time. And uh, my father had a vast library of books. You know, he had, a, he had a subscription to Playboy magazine and a host of other publications that were coming in the mail on a regular. And I read everything early on, you know, before my parents, my parents weren't even, weren't even aware of the fact that at this young stage in my life, I was searching for answers. And it's in these various publications that I start to have a better understanding on, on what was going on in the world. And, and again, none of this was being taught in school. So I'm learning about Vietnam from Playboy magazine. I'm, I'm, I'm learning about Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and Lincoln Rockwell from reading these publications. Um, and it really did something to me in addition to Life magazine. So before we had the internet, we had, you think about it, Life magazine, National Geographic and Playboy. So these are the, the, the three publications in which I was studying on a regular searching for answers. And at the same time, I'm seeing the, the, the power of photography in, in all three publications, in addition to all of the photography books that my father had. He had a vast library, consistent mainly of war photography. And it just captivated me early on. So I would go through his entire library, looking at every photograph, reading every book. So before I even physically picked up a camera, I developed a profound love for photography. 
And that's how my vision was shaped. And, it, and, and also, most of my, my, my uncles, they were all photographers as well. They were all military men. And what the cell phone is to young people today, during that time with veterans, the camera was a very important tool because they were traveling overseas and they were documenting their experiences. And I also grew up in, 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 a, in a space where one of my uncles used to do slideshows during the holiday seasons when all of the cousins would get together. That was like the treat to gather us, gather us up and just show us images of both the family and photographs that were made over the many years. So uh, early on, that stuck in my mind. And then so what we, we, No, go ahead. Go ahead, Finish. Lisa. Um, why don't we look at a few of those photographs that you supplied us with from the 60s while you're describing what you're saying so that yeah. people have a better feel for what you're, where you're coming from. Sure. Well, this right. first photograph here is a, a, an image I made during Old Timers Day in Red Hook, the community in which I came from. And what made this photograph really, uh, 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 what made me make this photograph was the fact that this young boy reminded me so much of myself. This particular street is a street that I traveled on around the same age, and it allowed me to explore my community. Right in, in front of the park is, is a space where a lot of the Vietnam veterans used to come and play the Congress, in addition to us playing ball. And that's my project right behind him. And this, this idea of creating this image was greatly inspired by the work of Leonard Free. I wanted to create images that told stories. So here you, you have this young boy standing in a sign that says, no standing any time. And you have the Marcus Garvey flag on the left and you have the American flag on the right. So I like to always open up this image here because it represents me at a very early stage uh, searching, searching for answers. Love the photo, love it. Thank you. Uh, and, and again, growing up in the 1960s, these are some of the photographs I grew up seeing early on in my life. And I'm trying to interpret what's going on. You have the war in Vietnam taking place. You have the civil rights movement, but now I'm seeing these men with signs. I am a man and I'm looking at American soldiers, National Guardsmen with, with, with their weapons at the ready with bayonets. And I can't understand what's happening at this point. And no one is giving me answers, but it's these images that really sparked my curiosity. Mm. Photographed by Ernest Withers. And uh, Life Magazine was, was a publication that I read all the time because it gave me a gateway into a larger world. So I always found myself just going through Life Magazine as a young kid. You know, the, we had a library in the community. And I would spend a lot of time there. When I uh, ran out of public American publications to read, I started going into, into the foreign publications such as French Match Magazine and German Spiegel Magazine because they gave me a broader understanding on what was going on in the world. But it was mm -hmm. Life Magazine. I wanted to go back to that picture of the Life Magazine because that really represents what was going on in America for me. You have a young kid, Joe Bass, that was shot in Newark, New Jersey in 1967. I'm seven years old at the time. And on the uh, right next to it, you have a soldier uh, who, a Marine in, 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 in Kantian, where it was a lot of combat, you know, to, over, over on the DMZ. So this is like the headlines. And I'm looking, this at, I'm looking at this as a child. Even though I made this photograph later on, I came back to it because it reminded me of the images in which I was seeing. And no one was explaining to me what was happening at this point. It wasn't being mentioned in school. My parents weren't talking to me. So I had to do deeper research to understand it. So these publications were very instrumental uh, in aiding me in my growth and development as a young child throughout my adulthood. Mm -hmm. And it was a photograph of my father that was very important that you oh, skipped past. That's yeah. the one, that one. Okay. that, yes. right? And this is a very important photograph right here because my father is from Brooklyn, New York, and he enlisted in the Navy at the age of 17. And here he is in 1955, the same year that Emmett Tilt was, was, was murdered, and, and he had to deal with a lot of racism while he was in the military. Well, for some reason, at 17, he was able to, to go into service and become a photographer where he served on the USS Intrepid, which is now a museum here in New York City. And he would travel, he spent six years in the Navy, he traveled out the Mediterranean, and his, one of his main tasks in the service was to document military life. And my father came home with those photographs and that kind of like informed me of his journey. But I felt it was necessary to show this because we never talked about his experience in the military. You know, I know that he came home traumatized. He was pretty much never the same. And, and I, I'm still searching for answers of what was it like for a black man back then to be in the Navy during the 1950s? Hmm. Wow. And, uh, and the books that inspired me, 1968, you know, the height of the Vietnam War, 
the assassinations that are going on in America, I'm taking all of this in. And it's these images that, that, that really sparked my curiosity to want to know what's going on in Vietnam. Around the same time, uh, my community took its first loss, Sam White. He, he died in Vietnam in, in, a, in a, a bombing, and he was right in my court. Now, I'll never forget, it was the summer of 1967, 68, that we were playing during the height of the summer, and two military personnel came to notify his mother that their the only son had died in Vietnam. And I will never forget, everything happened in slow motion. I heard her, her screams just echo throughout the community. And that stayed with me for, for many years of my life. I always want to know who was Sam White and why did he die in Vietnam? So it's that point early on in my life that I wanted to know what was going on in Nam because also a lot of brothers are coming back into the community who had served in the war and I just looked at these mysterious men who I didn't know. So it, it, would, go, it would go on to produce a 40 year research in terms of trying to understand what was the war in Vietnam like and how did it impact my community. And images like this here of the massacre in May Lee. You know, I'll never forget as a young child looking at the photographs of this massacre and it, it furthered me wanting to know. And at the same time, the very first movie that my father ever took me to was a movie called The Green Beret with John Wayne. And here I am, eight years old, watching this movie, did this propaganda film about Vietnam. And of course, John Wayne's the hero. And that movie traumatized me. And it put a seed, it traumatized me, but at the same time, it put a seed in my mind to go on this research to know more about this war in Vietnam and why, and what was the draft and why were so many people on both sides dying. Explain us, explain to us a little bit about how that experience growing up in the 60s is affecting your work today. I think what it, what it has done, it, it's caused me to just search for answers. What I've done, as I said before, with the war in Vietnam in particular, I'll say it's one of the most extensive forms of research I've done throughout my entire career. So I started when I saw that movie, The Green Away, The Ray. Uh, I went on to, to, to find out more about Sam White. I went on to, to interview hundreds upon hundreds of Vietnam veterans that served in the war, you know, not only interviewing them, but photographing them. Um, and at the same time, it made me uh, against the war. Despite the fact that I would go in the military in the 1970s, I turned against the war. And, and when the Iraq war came, you know, I made it a point to document that experience because I wanted to use my photographs as a form of protest. So just like the protesters of the 1960s, I wanted to protest this war right now because I felt that it was wrong. So uh, it just became a, a very extensive a, a project of mine, photographing veterans of all wars. Because not only did I document soldiers that fought in Vietnam, but I also went on to document Viet, uh, World War II veterans, Korean War veterans, and those that fought in other conflicts that America has had over the many years from Iraq, Afghanistan, Grenada, and Panama. Mm -hmm. And this one book really transformed my life. For whatever reason, my father had a signed copy of this book on his coffee table back in 1969. And, mm. uh, and it was different from all of the other books because this one was on a coffee table, not in a library. And I felt that it was tailor made for me. And I opened up the book and I was just fascinated with the images. First time I'm seeing black and white photographs. At this time, I had an uncle that was stationed in Germany. So looking at this particular photograph, it gave me a better understanding on what, what he was going through over the matter of fact, I had two uncles stationed in Germany at that time. So this is the very first photograph in the book that showed me the power of photography. And I would go on to, to look at all of the images in the book over and over. But what became most intriguing with this was the fact that I was reading the book now and I was developing, I was looking at words that were, I was unfamiliar with. Words like uh, colored, Negro, lynching, redneck, uh, Jim Crow. So I would oftentimes have my dictionary and my and a notebook, and I would write down these new vocabulary words to better understand what this book was talking about. Because what, what, what Leonard Free did with Black and White America was it was not only was it photographs, but it was a diary. So his writings throughout the book are, are based off his, his notes that he took during his travels. And what makes it so interesting with this particular photograph that really stayed with me because it showed me the power of making images that made statements. And this would inform my career because I wanted to create images that made statements and, and, and spoke to the time. And here you have a, a, a Muslim with a paper in the heart of Midtown saying we, we must have justice. And below that statement, you have an attack dog in Alabama uh, being put on an African-American man. So I'm nine years old trying to process all of this here. But what made it all come full circle to me is just over the summer, you know, I connected me and 
uh, I never met Linda Freed, but I met his wife, Bridget, and we became close friends. And she gave me an original copy of that photograph. And I would go, go to learn, learn that, that Linda Freed went to the same high school that I went to. So it's a very interesting path that I've been on in regards to the influence that Linda Freed's work has had on me over the many years. And this is another photograph that was, uh, the one that you just passed was in the book. So it has opened up my world to, to a, a, a community outside of mine. I saw Harlem for the first time in this book. I was able to see the Jim Crow South for the very first time. This is the second cover of the book. And the reason why I shared this one, because uh, the young boy is called Muscle Man, Muscle Boy. And I, I felt that this book actually gave me muscles. This book gave me insight and strength because it almost served as a roadmap to me growing up in, black, in white America. You know, it was the very, it, it actually became the number one book that would guide me on the path that I'm on right now. So I owe a great debt to Leonard Freed. And this is one of the photographs I made inspired by Leonard Freed. So I, when I started to uh, make images, I wanted to capture images that told stories. And when, when, when going back to Leonard Freed's work, all his images had statements. So this is, this is one of the first images I made when I came home from the service, one of the very first. And here you have a sign, if it concerns you, it concerns us. To the right, you have more than sickness, uh, light skin and black bitches suck. So I wanted compelling images that it's one thing to shoot uh, the man who, who's laying down, but when you add the other elements in it, it, it creates a deeper narrative. So I wanted all of my work to just speak. This is another one that was inspired by the work of Linda Free. You know, I'm in Harlem and one of the things that my father taught me is carry your camera with you all the time, have the cap off, have it set properly and just always be observing. Yeah, that's an amazing picture. All of these photographs were inspired, just, just decisive moments. This is at a march in Washington, I believe in 2004. And it's just something I saw and I just felt it was, it was just a, a moment that needed to be documented. So I'm known a lot for my candid images, but you know I wanted to showcase photographs that were more documentary and, and, and street photography. You know, to, to to just help people better understand the work in which I do. This is one of my most recent images I made a few years ago. So uh, I, I switched from from a film, and I'm using a digital platform now. The day you took that photograph, did you talk to the men and? and ask them to take, or was it just, just candid or what? It was just a moment. I might have been about 100 feet away, and I mm -hmm. anticipated that something was happening because the Hasidic gentleman, he was moving from bench to bench, and I watched him, and I just had a feeling that something was going to happen. So I had my camera set and at the ready, and to my surprise, he sat right down next to this gentleman, and I was able to capture this, this reaction. So it was just That's a matter cool. of intuition and sensing that something was going to happen. Yeah, good timing, man. Excellent timing. And, and same with this photograph here. I'm trying to tell stories with my work. I feel that it's necessary. It's one thing to take an image, but I want people to think. I want to convey messages here. And this is here. You have a sign in the background. Being a man means being there. You have a soldier who just came out of airborne training. And you have a young brother observing. And you have another brother walking who, who's in the medical field. And this was taken in Harlem a while ago, uh, back in, I believe, 1995. This is another photograph I took when I first came home from the military. Um, I came home during the summer of 1980. I came home to a change in world. Uh, I embraced photography. My father had put me under the wing and he started teaching me. You know, uh, he taught me darkroom uh, techniques, uh, light composition, and uh, he, he, he put, put me on task. You know, he told me it's very important to have themes. So one of the themes that I, that I took on was documenting the subways and the graffiti and all the life that took place uh, uh, below ground. And um, this is one of the first images, one of the first images that I, that I captured in the subway system. And it, it just speaks to the time. You know, we look at what's going on in America today in terms of police brutality. For me, it has pretty much always existed when I, when I was coming of age. And just another decisive moment, things that we see in our travels. Most of the Im images I was making going to and from work. This is one of the very first photographs I made when I decided to embrace photography. It was taken in 1975 with my mother's Kodak Instamatic camera. The very first camera that I used, a 126. And these are three of my friends. And uh, 
I decided that I wanted to be a photographer at this point. I needed a purpose in my life. And it's like putting the camera in my hand, it, it almost became like a compass. It led me on a path and it gave me a voice. And uh, most of my partners were graffiti artists and I embraced that early on, but it was something magical about freezing time in motion that really stayed with me. And it gave me a purpose in life. And, uh, and my friends became some of the very first people I saw that started to photograph. But when this image came out, because back in those days, you took your film to the local drugstore. And when this image came out back then, I was really impressed with it. And I, I felt at that point, I have what it takes to be a photographer. So uh, early on from 1975 to maybe 78, I, I, I shot, I used that camera. And then I fell on the hard times and I just gave it up for a moment. This is another photograph I took when I came home from the military. And what it says to me, it, 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 it it, it told me that I have a responsibility to save these young kids out here. This is at a train station in Brownsville and I'm about to get on the train and this kid is on the other side. And whatever reason, you know, you got the kids in the back horse playing. This kid comes up to the bars and he holds on the bars and he's looking at me. I don't remember the conversation we had. I don't even think there was a conversation, but the way he's looking at me, he's like saying, help me. And whatever reason we departed and I would never see him again. And the image stayed in my mind to this very day. And it, it, it informed me that I have a duty and responsibility to try to save these kids out here because they're going through very difficult times. So uh, it's a picture that haunted me for a long time. And it's my hope that hopefully this young kid is alive because I would love to reconnect with him and see him. But I've seen this face so many times throughout my life. And when I do, I try to lend my hand because I know that there are, there are a lot of children out there going through very difficult times. And it was very apparent in looking at this kid here. I love that photo. <clears throat> you know, during my time working on Rikers Island, I spent 20 years. I started in 1983. I pretty much became a correction officer because I had just came out of the military. And my father told me that it's very important that you have stability. And as a veteran, you have certain benefits. So you should consider working for government. So I applied for a number of city jobs and corrections was one of the first jobs that called me. And, and, and I, I answered the call. And I looked at it as an assignment that I needed to be on in life. Because a lot of my friends prior had been arrested and all for crimes they didn't commit. So I already knew the system. I knew I had friends that were locked up in, in real time. So I, I took on the job. And it was, it was a very challenging experience for me. I was 23 at the time, but it was a, a journey that I felt I needed to be on. And that photograph of the young man is somebody I met in jail. His name was Cy Green. And, uh, and he was always telling me that he was innocent. This is actually shot in the jail at, at punitive segregation. And he always stated that he was innocent and he would end up being locked up and he did 22 years and they eventually found out that he was innocent and he was let loose after 22 years. So I had what? to put the article to remind people of the fact that you have a lot of people incarcerated for crimes they didn't commit. And, and, and Cy was one that he had to adjust to the environment because it was so violent so he had to adapt to that situation and get violent with those that got violent with him. And, uh, and I documented my whole experience in jail from the moment I was called on the job, being investigated to the time I retired, I documented my whole entire experience, both officers in which I work with and in the inmate population. Because I needed a journey, a diary of my life but more importantly, I needed to engage the young men, both officers and the inmates to try to guide them. This is a photograph taken from the inside of, the, of my booth in, in Rikers Island. And here you have a young man who's a, what we call the suicide aide on the phone. He has a shirt that says alive with pleasure. And then in the background, you have a young man who's broken and he, um, he has no power in the housing area. You can tell from his posture that he's not really doing that well. You know, so this is a very important photograph I actually just discovered about maybe five years ago, searching for old negatives. That's an amazing photograph. So how, um, working as a correction officer, and you were out also when you were on your free time, you were photographing a lot of the people on the street that were showing all this love. So how, how did you switch from one mindset to the other? During well, that I carried my camera everywhere I went. I went to work with it. When I would leave the job with it, I was photographing, going to work, leaving work. I felt it was necessary, you know, after dealing with such a, a, a negative atmosphere, it was very important for me to find some joy because I'm dealing with hate and violence every day. So I would leave searching for love, searching for joy, searching for a sense of hope. And I would document it. I would speak to a lot of young men on the street and I would let them know that I'm just coming from Rikers Island, 
And that's not the place to be because during that time, a lot of young men in my community felt that it was a rite of passage to go to Rikers Island as they called gladiator school back in the days. And I was trying to deter them that's not the place to be. I'm a witness to that and you don't want to be there. And uh, it, it became, it, it was very challenging because a lot of young men were falling victims. This is around the time of the crack epidemic where that draw had such a gravitational pull on so many people, they were falling victim, victim to it. I would eventually see a lot of them in the system. So I was trying to use my experience to just talk to young people on the street. I would even go downtown Brooklyn just trying to sound the alarm. This photograph here was taken in Central Booking in Manhattan where I worked at for 10 years. And this is a, an area in which when people get arrested in, in Manhattan, they come to Central Booking to get processed in they get indicted or they go see a judge and they get, they, you might get indicted and you go on to start your court procedures. Back in those days, how did you get permission to do this, to, to be able to photograph in these spaces? I had no permission at that time. It was just, it's something I felt I needed to do. I developed a strategy where I started photographing my coworkers first, starting with the brass. So at that time, a lot of them didn't have pictures of themselves. I was able to, to, to do that strategically. I gave them photographs and I would do personal work pretty much on the, on the side. Nobody really knew I was doing it except a small group of people I was working with, but they never really bothered me with that. Right, good. The photograph here is very important because it, it, it's a part of my research on Vietnam. This is taken back in 1988 and I used to see a lot of uh, gentlemen maybe about 10 years older than me. I would approach them on the street I say, you don't, with all due respect, you don't mind me asking you, oh, where was you at in 1968? And on this particular day, I was coming from work and I saw this guy, uh, Terry, and he, he was intoxicated. And I asked, I was on the phone and I asked him, if you don't mind me asking, where was you in 1968? He goes into his wallet, he pulls out a military document called the DD Form 214. He hands it to me. He was in Vietnam in 1968 and 1969, saw a heavy combat in the Marine Corps. And when he showed me that, he, he, he invited me to his home in the projects on the Lower East Side and brought me into his apartment, showed me a photo album when he was a promising uh, a college football star. But he ended up going to Vietnam and the Marines. He got messed up. He was never the same. And we didn't have a lot of conversation with each other. But as I was about to depart him, he raised up that fist in power. And I felt it was necessary to tell not only his story, but the story of other Vietnam veterans that were struggling. And he was dealing with severe PTSD behind his experience. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be moving along soon, but I want to ask you: Have you ever have you ever had an assignment from any of these major publications that we're familiar with? Throughout my career, I have never been given an assignment whatsoever. The only assignments I've been given during my during my time as a photographer has been in fashion. I've done a lot of fashion work, but I've never been on any documentary assignment. Uh, most of the projects in which I created are all self assignments that I've just pretty much person they're all personal projects. And this is all the part of the Vietnam series right here. I have over like maybe 5,000 photographs of my encounters. This is at the Veterans Day Parade. Wow, 5,000 on veterans. So, okay, so is there anything you want to wrap that up and then we're going to um, go to asking both of you, this, you know, the same question and then let you two talk amongst each other. Oh, that's a beautiful photograph. This is an ongoing series I've been working on for about 40 years now. And it's, it's a following Leonard Fried's uh, path and it's called Black in America. You know, so I'm just documenting, you know, black people of color with the American flag either on them or around them and just showing just different perspectives. This I love that photograph book. because it shows affection in a very honest way. Yes, and they're you two know. soldiers. In my conversation, I was finding out that the young woman, she's also a soldier. And this young man was preparing to go to Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, one of the most okay. difficult days of my life, you know, 9-11. So uh, I was, I happened to be there that day and I was spending a few days just documenting that experience. And out of that, you know, I, was, I captured this photograph right here of a fireman who's just taken in, in the day of everything that had happened. This is later on, on September 11th. You know, we are dealing with search and rescue and it's just, it's at a point of almost hopelessness at this point. And this mm. particular fireman just fell back and he's just taking in everything that happened. And I just felt the need to just freeze this moment in time. Mm. Wow. So, um, 
I do have a, so I have a question for Joseph and Jamal, and then each of them can answer the question and then maybe have a discussion about it between each other. So both of you more or less have had your careers founded on photographing within your own communities, like in Brooklyn, Spanish Harlem. And I would like to know how is that different and how important is that working around people that you know, um, as opposed to moving into a different community? Like how do you, how, you know, how does it differ? Being in your community and photographing people that you feel comfortable around and, and then going out into a different community. And one of the reasons why we're asking that question is because um, a lot of people don't understand the power that they have. I mean, you understand, you both understood the power that you had. Maybe you didn't realize it at the moment. But you understood, you know, the familiarity that you had in the areas that you were photographed. So we'll go Jamal first and then hear from Joseph. For me, it made sense to really start in your community first because that's where you know the people at. For me, I knew everyone and, and back then you knew the parents. So there was always subject matter and the love was always there, you know, cause the love is what I look for first. So I started off in my community, uh, two communities. I started in Red Hook where I, where I was born, I, where I was spent, you know, my, my youth and I moved out to East Flatbush. So I had two communities in which I focused on almost parallel. When I was photographing Red Hook, I would re return back to Flatbush and vice versa and just document because I knew everybody. And at that point, I was able to build up a body of work, communicate with people, develop my portfolios. So once I had really comprehensive portfolios now from people within my community, they really represented, the, you saw the joy now because I know them personally, then I was able to branch out into other communities where I didn't know people, show them that work and convince them that my intentions were sincere. But starting with my community first was necessary because we had problems there. You know, when I came home from the military, there was a war going on. A lot of young men were, 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 were at war with, with each other. And I needed to put an end to that. So I would travel throughout the, the, the community of Flappers, up and down Church Avenue, not even realizing that these different groups of men I'm engaging with were at war with the groups I just finished leaving. But it was something about the camera that opened them up to me and allowed me to connect with them. It was more than just the photograph. The photograph was secondary. What was most important to me, particularly with the young men, were to engage them and try to get to the root of the violence that was going on. And I wanted them to know that I recognize you. I see you. You are not invisible to me. And I want to document your greatness. And I would do that all up and down the avenue, developing relationships that I still have to this very day. So it was very important for me to start in my neighborhood first because that's where a lot of the problems were existing. And then I would troubleshoot to go to other neighborhoods with the same mentality, you know, just to connect with young people, to find out what was going on. My camera became both a time machine, but it also became a microphone that allowed me to communicate with people and, and, and others communicating with me about what was going on. And Marvin Gaye's song is so appropriate, what's happening, brother, because that's the frequency I was on. You know, when I think about that song, I want to know what was going on. I'm back on the scene. I need to know what was happening. Did you have, did you develop a certain technique when you were out in the streets to get people to warm up to you? Was there like I, one thing that you kind of said, okay, this is the way I'm going to like approach people so that they would be? It's a number of things that, that I did. I, I think first, uh, I was introduced to a book by Dale Carnegie called How to Win Friends and Influence People. It became very instrumental in my ability to connect with people I didn't know. So I learned the art of communication. I studied body language to know how to approach. Uh, I walked with a bag with a, a, pound, a pound of bananas in and a chessboard. I would engage a lot of young brothers on the street and say, yo, I, I, you, know, you know how to play chess? I said, this is a game of life. It's very important that you know how to play this game to navigate through life. So I would introduce chess to a lot of these young guys and tell them that it's strategy and you need this to survive. So it's about building relationships. So between my camera and my chessboard, having those bananas, you know, and, and, and the camera and even photographs, they were all pretty much open to engagement. So I, I never really had a problem. So that was my strategy, you know, communication is key. So I think we'll move on to Joseph and hear what his, what he has to say about this question, which is, cause- Please you know, repeat the question, thank you. You remember the question or should oh, I- just, Please, please repeat it again, thank you. Okay, so what I'd like, what we'd like to know is like, you know, your, a lot of your work, and the success of your work, like Jamal, 
has to do with photographing intimate neighborhoods, you know, like Spanish Harlem and other areas that you felt really comfortable in. So how important was that familiarity to you? And I'm, I'm asking for other photographers to hear this as well, especially young photographers, sure. um, as opposed to like, if you just went into an unknown, you know, an area that you're not that familiar with, how much of an impact that had on your ability uh, to create I mean, I, such Yeah, I get it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm like Jamel, I'm photographing, you know, I'm photographing in my neighborhood. I live on Cumberland Street in Fort Greene. I'm photographing out my window. I'm photographing people play dominoes. I'm photographing afros. You know, my 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 hair was about. I'm, I'm Jimi Hendrix fro, right? So, you know, we had we had a style. We had to look good, right? I got my brother, and my sister. I got people. I'm photographing. You know, do what I tell you to do. Put this on. Put that on. So that was fun. But the minute you got out in the street and photographed and start talking to people. Because I don't photograph a lot. I mean, I do photograph a lot, but I do this more than I photograph. See this here? This is probably more important for young photographers to understand, you know? Uh, yes, I did feel comfortable music-wise, culture-wise, food-wise, even the girls, everybody, the way we dressed, the Converse sneakers we were wearing. Yeah, back in the 60s, we were wearing Converse's, guys. <laughs> Not the ones who invented it. Anyway, so, you know, all of that, be become so much, but it was not easy. Spanish Harlem, I don't get, I'm Puerto Rican, but it doesn't matter. I'm Puerto Rican, African American, I don't, I am those people. But I'm on the outside. I always got to be on the outside. I can't get, I get very intimate, very close. I spent a lot of time. I spent one and a half a year photographing on one block. I spent two years photographing in one building, right? With different wow. parents and different people. So that's the way I work, but that way of working enabled so, to do the same work in Vietnam and in, Z in Zimbabwe and in Mozambique and in Kurdistan and every other place and in Afghanistan and 9-11 because 9-11 was a different kind of approach for us. We were out here photographing it, but we were talking to people that were affected by it. So I'm more interested in hearing that human, having that human exchange with people because I'm a humanist. It's not about color for me. It's not about race for me. It's not about class for me. It's about people for me. And, and I think Spanish Harlem and Taxi allowed me to understand and grow with, with that foundation, which enabled me to go on to work for National Geographic, to photograph a whole country for four months, Mauritius. That's a very different way of photographing. But that slow turtle approach, which is Joseph Rodriguez. I'm not the rabbit. I am the turtle. Going slow, you know, like a Bombay in East LA, you know, an old car, real slow with the music. That's me, right? And music's very important. So that way, that approach is intrinsic in all the work that I do, everything. I'm all about family. You look at all the projects I've done from Romania to Africa, from Africa to Kurdistan, it's always family. So, Joseph, did you also develop over many years of photographing a specific technique that allowed you to enter into the into the hearts and minds of people while you were photographing? Can you share some of that? Because I know it's not something, it's something that gets developed over a long period of time. It's this. That's the technique. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I just, what I try to do in my work is, I'll give you the word amplification. What does the word amplification mean? The act of enlarging or adding detail to a story or statement. That is what I work with. That is what I want the work to do, to expand the conversation or expand what you see, right? And to give, it, this work is never about me. This is about the people in front of the camera. Right? For example, Los Angeles. I fly from LA, 1992, I'm here with my family, my daughters are born, I'm seeing my mom here, and it's, it's Easter time, and all of a sudden the Rodney King whole episode is in front on the TV. I immediately wanted to go out. My initial approach to go to Los Angeles was to photograph my own West Side Story. All I wanted to do is hang out with gangsters, smoke weed, drive cars, and see pretty girls and dance music. Chuck, that was it. When I got there, I was the discovery was very simple. 
People were dying, children were dying. The first neighborhood I went to was Watts. I had Malcolm X's autobiography of Malcolm X. I mean, I had the autobiography of Malcolm X in my back pocket, read it seven times. And here I am walking into that community. And the first question I asked this grandmother is, tell me about the riots in 1965. I know our history. I mean, in 65, I was walking down Bedford, Bedford Avenue with my mom and everything was on fire. Malcolm mm. X, all this stuff is there. So, you know, I come at it as a journalist with the five W's, who, what, where, when, and why. That's how we start a conversation. But I know my history. So people appreciate that. Plus, you know, music similar. So we're listening to Marvin Gaye. We're doing our own thing. I'm, I'm eating fried chicken with them. You know, I mean, I do, a, that's how I work. I don't, if I, if I have an assignment that's different, I got to go in, I got to get to work and, and leave. You know, I just spent six months photographing Uber drivers here in New York as an ex-taxi driver. So, you know, I, 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 I think time, it's not about who you are, what color you are and where you come from, your class. It's really about time. And if you have that commitment to sit down and listen to people the way I have at the kitchen tables with so many families, families that lost children, people that were being shot at and, and praying with them and eating with them and going to quinceaneras with them and going to hospitals with them. That's mm. the field work that Joseph Rodriguez does. You just see the pictures. So you just go like, oh, wow, that's cool. Whatever, you know the hallways in Spanish Harlem, the nights, you know, what do you do when you have a five-year-old that comes up to you? What do you do when a five-year-old comes up to you and says, hey, could you be my father? You know what that feels like? In this horrific environment of crack cocaine and garbage and rats and bullets and dead people and cops and arrests, and a five-year-old comes up to you and says that to you? Now, I didn't have a father. I did, but, you know, who knows where he went, but you know, I had a, a stepfather who was a dope fiend, right? So that was my, those were my models, right? And so this kid comes to me and I cried that night. That's why I have journals. I got about six journals from Spanish Harlem because those voices bring me to those living rooms. Gotcha. So I think we're gonna open up so that anyone who wants to ask a question um, can do so, and we can elaborate on anything that you've already discussed. Um, Glenn, are you ready to um, see if there's some questions that need to be asked? Sure, if, um, love to hear from the audience. Uh, if you have questions or comments, um, you can put them in chat, or you could use the raise your hand function in the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you raise your hand, I'll actually call on you and you'll ask the question. If you uh, put it in the chat, I'll, I'll just read it from the Gary. chat. So uh, let's give people, somebody used to Sam. give people a second. <clears throat> Anybody? So we've yeah. got a good audience out there. There's over 75 people. So clearly there's some uh, comments on this interesting discussion. Okay, I see a raised hand by Jasmine Smith. Um, Jasmine, why don't you unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask your question. Hi, hello. My name is Jasmine. I am a student at Bard. Um, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Um, and it's more so just thanking both of you gentlemen for sharing your story and being so involved in our culture. Um, I admire that. That's one of the reasons why I'm back at Bard as a non-traditional student to, you know, be able to spread our culture and, and in an enlightening way. Um, so I appreciate being able to have this experience and listen to you guys as hardworking men coming from where you come from. Um, I can relate to that. And I think it's beautiful what you guys are doing. I don't have any questions. Everything you guys said was very heartfelt. So I just wanted to thank you for your time. Um, and, and I look forward to looking at you guys' work more. This is my first time really digging into photo history and observing, analyzing the way I do now. So I appreciate it. And I thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Jasmine. Hey, Lisa, this is Jewel. How are you? Hey, Jewel. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I basically you made a point to be here. I haven't seen you in so long. I like the hair. I want to say hello to Jamel because Jamel <laughs> is one of my mentors and I've learned so much from him through the years. And I just basically want to say thank you for 
all the talks and for everything, for all your guidance and everything that you've helped me with. And even you, you know, I've talked and all the things that we've done. And like I said, you know, coming in, I started photography, you know, as a way of like sort of getting back, you know, I was going through some personal issues and I picked up the camera and that was basically sort of like my outlet. And that was like kind of my therapy and, you know, we don't know the rest. And I just basically kind of want to thank the people who kind of helped me move forward and what I do today. So I had surgery, you know, I'm not going to talk long. I am um, doing well, and I just want to say hello to everybody, and I just basically want to thank everybody for their stories, and I was sitting here taking notes, and, you know, and Jamal knows, you know, I'll probably be reaching out, asking some questions, <laughs> but I just basically say thank you so much for, you know, everything that you've shown me and, and all the time that we have. I've learned so much over the years, and I really appreciate it. Much love to you. Thank you, Jules. Thank Jewel. you so much, Jules. Thank, so thank you. It's so good to hear from you that you're out. Oh, okay. And I, I'm so glad your surgery went well, too. Yeah, Thank we'll you. talk. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Be in touch, we'll talk. Thanks. All right, we have a question from Carrie Mason in the chat. Um, Carrie has a question similar to what was discussed before with a slightly different angle to it. But why is it, is it important for people from a culture to be able to tell their own stories? And either Jamel or Joseph want to take that on. Because <laughs> where'd you go, Joseph? <laughs> because, because this book here will tell you, my friend, everything about us. Okay. Mm. When you see this book, this book will give you our history. Back when we had slavery, we had our own newspapers. Mm. Latinos had their own newspapers. Filipinos had their own, African-Americans, I mean, African-American slaves had their own newspapers, but then they were cut down. And I worked, I don't want to get into it too much because it's, it's, it's just a little bit too sensitive, but, you know, I was told that best photographers in New York are Jewish photographers. That's what I was told several times. I was told they're not going to make money photographing black and brown people several times. So every time I would hear that, I, you know, I would have to sort of, you know, balance it out and try to work in the industry because, you know, that's, that's what the industry was at the time. Now we're in a different time where we can talk about things, but we couldn't really talk about before. So um, uh, I, I just, I just feel that, you know, it's, it's a good time that we're having this conversation, but um, I can tell you, it was not easy. I needed to tell these stories. I needed to tell my story. And we, that's what we're doing. Jamel and I, I believe, Jamel, I speak, I speak for you, brother. You know, you're going to speak for yourself, but, you know, that's what, we, that's what we tell. That's what we say, you know, because when the media tends to run a story about us, you know, Sometimes it's good. Many times, you know, they missed a mark or they didn't really fill it out or, you know, people can be down on their luck, but people change. I mean, why do we stay and do what we do after so long? Why do we look for, you know, a gang member for two or three years, hoping that he he'll change his life? That's a very important part of the narrative, I think. Um, Glenn, you want to read a couple of the comments and then Jamel and <clears throat> Joseph can. Um you know, elaborate on or, or respond to it. I saw um, yeah, Colette Fournier says we, we must document our own stories. Um, hey, Colette. Complex X says we can't let colonizers twist the history. That's why we have to share our own authentic experiences. Then we got some other questions unrelated to this uh, comment. But uh, Jamel, you want to add anything to this? No, I'll take the next question. Okay, um, from Gary Malden. Um, can you discuss the use of color versus black and white as an element in storytelling? <laughs> it's, it's, it's really a matter of, of availability. During the early days, you know, when I was doing my own development, my father just stressed that I use uh, Tri-X film. So I had my, my, my dark in my basement. And I just opted to just do the black and white. And, uh, at the same time, for whatever reason, when I was seeing in black and white, I did more of documentary type work. That's when I found I was able to really go deep into the subway system and 
some of my better work. It's just something about it. I can't even explain the distinction between the two. But it's like when I put black and white film in my camera, my eye just start to see things totally different. And oftentimes during the early age, unlike today, you can make the switch and the Photoshop and just, you know, the, the, with the different apps of your camera, I used to take the so black and white out of the camera and put the color in, maybe when I put a photograph in the different high schools. So I always carry two rolls of film with me depending upon what I was photographing and what, what I was feeling inside. So it's, it's for, for me, it's more of a feeling. And, and, and at the same time, having my own dark room, I could take the black and white right away and just make prints and go back to the community and give them out versus the color would take a lot longer. So uh, now it's really a balance of both. Someone asked a question about photographing in a white neighborhood. Do you, do you, wanna, do you wanna read that? question, Glenn? Yeah, um, Hamilton William Dos Santos asked, were you able to take pictures in white neighborhoods without having any kind of problem? I think there's always a problem. Whenever you go into someone's life, it's a problem. Mm. The problem is, are you going to gain that trust? I photographed in white communities. I photographed around the world, actually. Uh, and not everybody's black and brown, and Asian and white and we're all the same. I don't know. I just, I, family, family to me. You know, if you start talking to people of different races about a very basic issue called family, and all of a sudden you, you'll start to hear these conversations where it just sounds so similar to everybody else, right? Yeah. So um, I think it's more about putting the time, putting the time. Jamal, you want to add anything to that? It sort of uh, speaks a little bit to the question we asked earlier about photographing in your own community. So, like, what, it, what has your experience been, like you say, in white neighborhood? I think it's intention. That's the key. You know, what is your intention? For me, I'm always searching for answers. If I'm going into a particular white neighborhood, I will have a particular portfolio that speaks to that community so, that, so they can see what it is I'm trying to do. I know that uh, those communities tend to be very patriotic, so I can go with my veteran series and speak about uh, my desire to learn more about the various wars that America has fought, and I will show images that mirror that. And I think that once you do that and you show that your intentions are sincere and you have work to back it up, you don't you won't have any problem. And over the many years, I challenged myself to photograph communities outside my own. And I was very successful. Very rare that I ever meet opposition because my strategy is always to keep a portfolio with me and have a business card. And I make it a point that I give people copies of those photographs and I make very special, intimate images, too. So regardless of what color is, I'm trying to find that joy and that love amongst everybody. And, uh, and I've been able to do that. That's the body work I haven't really shown a lot, but it's the work that I, I really pride myself on doing because oftentimes we are pigeonholed in one community and that's that's all that folks think that you can do. But I've documented a lot of communities. I document the Asian community, the Latino community, communities outside the country. And uh, you know, photography is a global language. And I find that once you, you show again that your attentions are sincere, people will open up to you. And that's, that's the key. Glenn, you wanna read some of the comments I've seen from people? Yeah, well, actually, we have a hand raise, and I always like to call on people to ask their own questions. Um, Michael Young, why don't you unmute yourself and ask your question? Hey, Michael. Um, I'm, hey, how you doing, Lisa? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this is not a question. This is just more, uh, I'm piggybacking on what the, what the young lady said. I thank God for these two goats, these two legends, and for the body of work that they've created and for the wealth of information that you guys were able to give on, on this in this forum. Um, thank you for, the, for your openness and for your honesty and, 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 um, and just for the, the techniques that you have imparted and, and shared with us. And I think, I think uh, I'm really thankful for, for, for my brother Jamel and for how he's been um, just a tremendous light in the community in terms of giving back and um, and just elevating all, all the other all the other photographers that are out there that are trying to really get their work seen and 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 get the stories of the people that are in front of our of our cameras, you know, more people to see that. And um and I'm also really grateful for Joseph's work and for um just his just your honesty and your rawness, brother. I really appreciate you and I really appreciate the body of work that you've created. And I'm gonna have to get all of those books autographed. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to put that out there for my brothers. And, and thank you. I appreciate all the work that you're doing. You're a great inspiration. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, can, I, can I just add something one second? I want to respond to Michael because, you know, Michael's a friend of mine on, on Instagram. What's up, Mike? Um, yeah, yeah. I just want to tell you something that I think really helps me. Because if you look at juvenile work, you'll see Joseph Rodriguez, woo, like you've never seen before. Being transparent about one's own struggles may help to ease the stigma. And that's helped me with my PTSD. That's the reason why I talk about this. Because and like Jamel, we have a lot of stories and a lot of ghosts and a lot of people that we've met who may not be with us. Yeah. So, so sharing this, because, you know, I didn't have any mentors growing up. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't, please, are you serious right now? I had gangsters as mentors. So, you know, I, we are mentors. Right. And that's what I, and that's what I really appreciate about the fact that you both did not have that access, but you make yourselves available to those of us and we can now benefit from that. So I'm really grateful for the two of you being in my life. Well, good. Don't forget to make me some fried chicken next week. I'm coming over. All right. Uh, I'm, I, 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 uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> all right, brothers. Love y'all. Thank, Thank you. Likewise. Yeah, Michael. Michael. Thank, you. Thank you for that, Michael. Um, so so uh, there's one last question here. Actually, there's a few, but let's, let's try to get through this one. Um, Zoraina asked a great closing question. What advice would you give to aspiring photographers today? I'll say follow, follow your passion, you know, carry your camera everywhere you go, have different things in mind, document situations that are very close to your heart, you know, and that's very important. Start with your, start with your family. I think what's key right now with, with, with COVID and everything that's going on, it's very important that we document our family. Let's start with our family first, start with our, our neighbors, our community, and get those stories. Not, not only photograph them, but it's important that we get that oral history. You know, there's a lot going on in this country, in this world. We need all hands on deck right now. And I think it's something magical and special about photographers. We have the ability, not only photographers, artists overall, we have the ability to make the world a better place. So I'll say to aspiring photographers and artists in general, let us work with, with, with sincere intentions to make the world a better place and focus on themes that are close to your heart that are pressing that can actually contribute to making the world a better place. Beautiful. Can I, can I just tell a funny little joke here real fast? You know, I remember when I was in school, just, just going to respond to this young lady who was asking this question. I was in school and I used to come to class and I was in Gio Perez's class and uh, I didn't have any work and a lot of us didn't have any work and it's a typical student problem, right? Uh, we were all like, oh, we're all depressed. And, and Gio would sit there with his feet up on his legs on, on a desk with the New York Times in his hand. He'd go, you should. And he, and he would say, he would say, 10 rolls of triads. And you would say, oh, I don't know. 20 rolls of triads, meaning keep shooting. You'll find your voice. Keep shooting, and you will find your way. Hmm. All right. Um, well, why don't we bring that to a close? That's, those are two great closing statements. Um, Lisa, you want to add anything else? Um, no, I just wanted to thank everyone tonight for coming and participating in Documentary Matters. And I hope that in some way, each person who listened in was inspired um, by the talk tonight. And I look forward to seeing new work, people maybe come, uh, submitting some work to doc, uh, Social Documentary Network. Well, thank you for that, Lisa. Thank you, Joseph. And I wanna, excuse me, I'm sorry. And I wanna thank Joseph Rodriguez and yeah, I met him. Hey, Joel. Hey, I think I said, let me say, say hello. I haven't seen you guys in so long. And, you know, I don't come into the city that much, you know, only because of COVID and stuff like that. You know, I, I'm off and on. But, you know, like I said, once, you know, I'm over things, you know, uh, you know, hopefully I'll be back. And, you know, can't, I look forward to kind of seeing everybody. I really miss everybody because, you know, I'm not I coming in. I miss you too. I don't know. We I, There's other questions coming in, but I don't think, I don't know if we have time. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, we could, um, you know, it's 8.30, we usually stop at 8.30, but, you know, if people want to keep talking, we can. There's an interesting question from Kenneth. What do you say, Lisa? No, I said you want to go in for another five or 10 minutes, at least? Sure, I'm game, and, you know, if people need to check out, we totally understand that. But, um, all right, so we have a question from Kenneth Aston. Uh, Kenneth, Kenneth, you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? You there, Kenneth? Okay. 
There he is. Oh, we lost him. Um, I see his, I see his, well, I saw his picture, but. Yeah, you, Kenneth, we can't hear you, but you're not muted. No, we, uh, no. Kenneth, well, I think you put your um, question in chat as well. Let me see if I can find it here. Okay, Kenneth, we can't hear you, but I'll just ask your question. I um, had a quick, quick question. How do you guys think the climate of today is affecting street photography? Um, I, 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 if it's okay, I'll just throw a quick answer out there. I think there's, for me, Personally, I think there's just too much street photography today. Mm. I mean, what does it do? What are we saying with all the street photography that's out there? Right? I mean, there's street photography and there's street photography. And, and what happens, I believe, is that a lot of younger photographers are not checking their history books because if you want to see some great street photography, then you need to go back to some books. All right? Mm. And I know that everybody wants to express themselves and that's all great. But understand what Instagram is about, folks. It's about making money, okay? And that's it. So we get our friends and we all clap and, you know, it, it, it is, it's something very interesting. If I put a picture up that has to do with some street gang members, right, on the street, whatever, all of a sudden I'm getting one, two thousand hits. Then I go put a portrait up and I only get maybe 50 hits or 25 hits. I'm not there from Instagram. So I think there's nothing wrong with street photography. I think it's a beautiful thing. But I mean, Jamel's approach to the street is very different than most street photographers. They'll see a corner. They'll see something interesting. They'll go for the light. But it's like engaging part. That's what I was trying to uh, reference. We can hear you now, Kenneth. Oh, great. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Well, first, I want to say uh, hello to everyone. I follow Jamal, Jamal on, uh, on Instagram as well. I've been following him for a couple of years now. Great photography. The early 80s stuff is amazing. Thank Saw you. you on the, they mentioned you on a documentary on PBS about the Undone cover. That was awesome. So I was wondering about the, um, what I was mentioning was the, the street photography and the climate today. I was wondering, yeah, like you had mentioned, you, know, you said that it doesn't affect you very much, but I didn't get Jamal, Jamal's approach uh, to people. I've been a photographer for well over 30 years now, uh, prior Air Force photographer. Okay. I work for the federal government at the UN Naval Academy. That's what I do. Wow, pretty um, good. Yeah, okay. It's a good job, but it's not as exciting as what I had prior to that. But anyway, <laughs> that's what I was just, just wanted to make a comment and just wanted to say thanks for uh, answering my question. And actually, this is very enjoyable and very inspiring. Thanks for Thank giving you. me some. Thank you for your question. Yep. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions here or hands raised. So I, I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank our photographers with us, Jamel and Joseph and Lisa for moderating and everybody out there. And if we could just all unmute ourselves and applaud everybody. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Pretty awesome. Thank you, SDN, for really- Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are doing really important work, so I'm really happy to have discovered you because I appreciate this channel and all the important work that you're doing. I've been introduced to a number of photographers. I've watched the uh, the Portland uh, police protests earlier, and I, I was given I was enlightened greatly. So I really appreciate what your organization is doing. And again, I appreciate Digital Silver for all the work they're doing. And I got to shout out Photoville because Photoville to me represents hope. When, we, when I look at that community every year with what they're able to create, they bring so many creative people together in the spirit of, of love and photography. And we need more of that today. We need those type of communities. So I appreciate all the visionaries who are really working to make this world a better place using the craft of photography. Now, can I say something about Photoville? This year, uh, I went before I had surgery, and they didn't basically have you know those uh, canisters. And that particular section over there where they used to Canisters. I think they sold that, you know, particular area over there. So all the pictures were on the fences, and you had to go down to each pier. It was like six piers, and that's how they have the pictures up there this year. I mean, it was still nice, but I was, you know, it, it's just always so nice when you go in and out of the canisters. You get a chance. To Jewel, that's specifically because of COVID. They they couldn't have the concentration no. that they've had previously. No, 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 they sold that area, so they don't. I don't. I just want to know if they're going to bring those canisters back. You know, once they realign that area, because they've sold that area where the canisters used to sit. 
Yeah, uh, we don't know the answer. They don't know the answer to that yet. They're still trying I, to figure I it know out. That ma'am, I'm going to tell you that they're they're just moving things around a little bit, okay. right? Okay. Oh, okay. And, and, you know, I'll give myself a little plug here. If you want to come by the city, Second Avenue and Houston Street, you can see a whole block of taxi journey through <laughs> my windows. Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm going to give a walk to next Saturday. If you're around 1130 in the morning in New York City, come on by, grab a cup of coffee, and I'll I'll take you for a nice journey. Got a lot of nice I'm going to have to do that because I almost crashed in my car looking at your images. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> my wife was like, look at the road, look at the road. I was like, it's Joe, it's Joe. <laughs> uh, Photoville is, is, the, is this model that's fantastic, I have to say. And, and even, even SD, SDN, I mean, Glenn, you've been there. You, it's yeah. amazing. What the, it brings the community together. When, when I saw Glenn up there a couple of years ago, it was great. You know, there's all these other things going on. And, okay. and you know, I mean, it's really fantastic that we can do that in New York City and, and keep the community alive. So Yeah, a lot of the pictures are on various locations. Like, you know, Jamel's is out in Prospect Park. My other friend, his is down on 139th Street. So they basically have to spread it out this year. But still awesome. Still awesome. They, they, have, they have this connection with the Parks Department. Like, can okay. you imagine? They got the green light with the parks department to exhibit any park in the city, any five mm -hmm. boroughs. It's amazing. You can't even do that in Europe. So, you know, bravo to Photoville for that. For mm -hmm. that. Okay. And also the schools, the kids come, right? So, you know, it's really like, I remember Spanish Harlem and Jamel's, Jamel's too. We had a lot of students come in. And that's, no. I, I feel it's the greatest. For me, students mm -hmm. the best story. Is Jamel's work still up, uh, or is it going to permanently up in Prospect Park? The work is up until December first. Uh, so I love that. Oh, really okay. All right, I want to say thank you and good night to everybody. And you could mm -hmm. uh, see this again on the SDN new cha YouTube channel in a few days. Good night, everybody. All thank right. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you, guys. Thank right. you, Glenn. Thank you. Jamel, right. love you. All right. All right. Take care. All right now. Oh, my brother.